Hello, grade twelves. So now we are here. We are at the big crux of what we are wanting to do for the DNA section, which is the nuts and bolts of protein synthesis. So this is probably a little bit of a slightly longer video, but you really need to make sure that you pay attention to all the different steps and skills that you are going to need to be able to do in order to understand protein synthesis and to answer the questions that would be posed to you. So please make sure that you've gone through part one, so that you have the basic understanding of what protein synthesis actually is, and that you're not getting lost as I start to go through this. So I'm going to jump straight into it. So remember, we've got our two phases that we have. There are two steps. The first one being transcription. Remind me, what is transcription? That is when I'm going from DNA to mRNA. So the creation of an mRNA strand in complementary fashion to the DNA. And then my step two is translation. That is where I take the mRNA, it attaches to a ribosome, and I read the code to create a protein. This is where I start joining my amino acids together. How can you remember which phase is doing which? Because they kind of really sound a little bit similar. Well, the way that I like to remember it is let's look at the word transcription. I have a C that comes after trans, and then I have translation. I have an L that comes after that. So I've got transcription and translation. What comes first in the alphabet, C or L? Well, clearly C comes first in the alphabet. So transcription is the first phase. So that's a nice little easy way for you to remember between which of those two it is. So let's get into it. Transcription. So here is my little hypothetical portion of a DNA strand that I'm going to be needing. So the key thing to remember when we're doing protein synthesis is we only need a small section of DNA in order to create this particular protein. It's only a short portion that gets unzipped by the DNA helicase in order for us to do this. So that is one gene that we're looking at. It's a small section of DNA. So the first step that happens in transcription is we unzip only the portion that we need. The rest of the DNA stays intact. So we unzip that portion and then the DNA actually separates. The parts where we have unzipped, those two polynucleotide chains are going to separate. So DNA, two strands of polynucleotides, but mRNA is one strand. So we're only going to use one side of the DNA to create the mRNA strand. And that is, you know, dictated for by other enzymes and other controlling things in the nucleus. So you don't have to worry. You will always be told which is the coding strand. So for example, I'm going to use this side today, the nucleotide sequence on this side as the coding strand. And then this side is going to be the non-coding strand. Essentially, this side is just relaxing, it's chilling here, it's staying there, it's not going to do anything. This is the side that is going to be used. So remember that. You are only going to use one side of the DNA to create your mRNA. That is the coding strand. And that is where you do that. So before I get into that, a little reminder. I told you that in DNA, when we did complementary base pairing when we did DNA replication, that adenine always goes with thymine in complementary fashion, and cytosine always goes with guanine, and obviously vice versa. If it's thymine on one side, it'll be adenine on this side, and if it's guanine on this side, it'll be cytosine on the other side. But now remember in the last video, we looked at that mRNA molecule and it looked a little bit funky, there was things different, and if you remember back to my video comparing DNA and RNA, there is a difference in the basis. So, in RNA, the only difference is there is no thymine, but you have a different nitrogenous base called uracil. So, if you have adenine on one side, it will be uracil that it is compared with. Cytosine and guanine stay the same. In the same way that if you have uracil on one side for any RNA molecule, if you have to complementary pair it with something else, it will be adenine on the other side, adenine uracil, cytosine guanine. Remember, there are two different forms of RNA that we are looking at, both mRNA and tRNA, and that becomes important. So knowing this, let's imagine that this is my coding strand. 
I've taken this set of nucleotides, this sequence of nucleotides, and I'm going to use this as my template to create my protein. Okay, so pause the video for a sec, write down these letters, and tell me what is then going to be the complementary mRNA strand. Remembering what I told you in this picture over here, how the complementary pairing works, how is this mRNA going to be created on this side? Pause the video, give that a go for me. Okay, I hope you had a chance to try and write that down. So starting from the bottom going up, is this what you had? Okay, you may have got it right, you may have got it wrong. So you see where the confusion can kind of happen. So if it's adenine on the DNA, it would normally pair with thymine, but there's no thymine in RNA. It would be uracil. So if it's A on the DNA, it will be uracil on the mRNA. If it's thymine on the DNA, it will be adenine on the mRNA. Now imagine if I was going to take this mRNA and I was going to do another complementary RNA. If I have U on this side, it would be with A. And if I have A on this side, it would be you. So make sure you have a good solid understanding of when I'm going from DNA to mRNA, how that complementary pairing works. Basically, you'll never see thymine in an mRNA. But that essentially is transcription. I'm going from DNA to mRNA. I've created this mRNA strand. So what happens next? The mRNA then separates from the DNA because it's a single strand. And then the mRNA is going to leave the nucleus. It's going to go into the cytoplasm and it's going to attach to the ribosome. What happens here in the nucleus? Well, this DNA then reattaches itself. Those hydrogen bonds in between the two polynucleotide chains reform and it then goes back into its double helix phase. So the DNA has done its job. It then goes back into its resting state. Now the mRNA has moved out and it is attaching to the ribosome. So here it is attaching to the ribosome. The ribosome is going to help us to make these proteins. Yay! So we're happy so far. Before I move forward, I want to talk a little bit about transfer RNA, tRNA. So it's also quite fortuitous because a lot of the times in pictures that you look at trying to identify things, the tRNA does look like the letter T. It really does kind of look like that shape. It's not going to quite look like that in the images that I'm going to use, but often it does kind of look like a little funky T that it looks like. But the important thing to remember about transfer RNA, and it's kind of linked back to this concept of enzymes. So remember, an enzyme is not a once-off thing that happens. An enzyme is reusable, and transfer RNA is reusable. It does the job that it needs to do over and over and over again. You're going to see why that makes a difference in a second. So what happens is one tRNA molecule can link with only one type of amino acid. So there are 20 different amino acids, but there are more than 20 different versions of transfer RNA. You'll see why, because there's different codes that can create the same amino acid. But one type of tRNA can link with one amino acid in the same way that one enzyme can only perform one type of function. It can't take different substrates and create a different product when it feels like it. It only has one job, but it can do that job over and over and over again. So that's basically a thing to remember about tRNA. So let's see how that fits in. So here is my ribosome, the red dot, and then I've got my mRNA strand. So what happens is the tRNA with its one specific amino acid comes and it links with the mRNA. So in this picture, I've got the green bit being this is the mRNA strand, this group of nucleotides. I then have the pink bit here, which is the tRNA, and it's got three nucleotides on that. And then I've got the one amino acid, this specific amino acid. So in my example, the circle amino acid only goes with UAC. The nucleotides UAC on the bottom here, it will only have the circle. If these were different letters, it would be a different amino acid. But what have we noticed about how this link has occurred and why this 
tRNA molecule has now linked in this specific place. Well, we know, again, you're going to love this word, that it now links in a complementary fashion. But now do you see where the difference comes in in the complementariness? I still don't see any thymine. There is no thymine here because thymine is only on the DNA molecule. This is still an RNA molecule, still RNA, and this is still RNA. So if I have adenine on one side, it's going to be uracil on the other side, not thymine, adenine and uracil. If I've got uracil on one side, it's going to be adenine on the other side. And the same with guanine and cytosine, they stay the same. So if this was cytosine, it would be guanine over here. So this complementary pairing, there are two words or terminologies that you need to know. On the mRNA strand, because we read it in triplets, or we read it in threes, the three set of nucleotides on the mRNA is known as the codon. So codon refers to the mRNA triplet. The tRNA triplet, the complementary one to the mRNA, corresponding complementary, is the anticodon. So the anticodon links with the codon in a complementary fashion. And it is in this manner that we are then able to read a specific order. So do me a favor, pause the video, write down the remaining letters that you've got of your mRNA strand, and write down what are going to be the complementary anticodons for each triplet on this side. As we go through the video, check that you got them correct as we move through. So we've started this process. So I've got one amino acid, but now what's going to come next? How do I know what comes next? Well, I'm going to read the next codon. The ribosome reads the next codon, which in this case is UUU. The tRNA that matches only to UUU, not any other tRNA, only the UUU complementary tRNA is going to come and bring its specific amino acid. And which one is that going to be? It's going to be AAA. So the tRNA, only the tRNA that has AAA. And look, it's bringing the triangle amino acid. Only the triangle will fit with AAA. Now I've got two amino acids together. They're right next to each other. So what do I do? I combine them. Now I'm starting to form my chain. What is this here again? What type of bond? It is a peptide bond peptide bond that is occurring here. Now, remember I said tRNA. What is the utility of it? It is that it is reusable. So now I've got this first tRNA that is sitting here. It doesn't just stay there. It's got another job to do. So what it does, it leaves the amino acid here because it's now attached and it goes off to go and attach to another amino acid to repeat that process over and over and over again when it links into an mRNA. And that is basically the process. We carry on. The ribosome moves along. It reads the next codon, which is UCG. The tRNA that is complementary to this, which is going to be AGC, brings the next amino acid, which in this case is the octagon. Amino acids combine. Forming along the chain, the previous tRNA, the AAA one, is then going to go and fetch another of its nucleotide, uh, another of its amino acids. Ribosome moves along. CCA is next. It brings in GGU. Hope that you got all of those anticodons right. Otherwise, go back and just check where you made your mistake. I've now got the square amino acid. What's going to happen? I'm now going to join them together. So now I'm starting to form this chain of amino acids according to the code on the mRNA strand. Now I'm at the end. So what happens when I get to the end of the mRNA strand? Well, this is termination. That's the end. That's the end of the recipe. So what I should have then is I should have a completed protein by the end. So the mRNA and the ribosome detach from each other. And the last tRNA goes out to go and get its last amino acid. This mRNA is then going to be broken down into its nucleotides. They become free-floating nucleotides, and then they will then reform another mRNA when needed. So you don't have tons of these just floating around. They get broken down, they've done their job, but then we can recombine them again for the next time. And what am I left with? My new protein has now been formed. This is my new protein. But 
the protein still kind of has to go through some processes of folding and changing its shape. It'll go to the Golgi complex. It will do all those kind of things, you know. But basically, the part of protein synthesis, I have created this protein, has now finished. And that is really it. But let's have a look. In summary, I started with my DNA strand. This was my code of DNA. Remember, I was only reading one side of the DNA, not both sides together. I'm only reading from the coding strand. I then have transcription, where I'm going to make an RNA strand in complementary fashion. Remember the difference being there's no thymine in an RNA molecule. If it's adenine on one side, it will be uracil on the other side. Then I'm going to go to translation, where I then make my protein. I use the codons on the RNA strand. I pair them with the anticodons of the tRNA, which are linked to one specific amino acid. And then I am reading in the chain of the amino acids. So that is the skills you need to be able to do. Half of the skills, if I'm almost there, we're not quite finished just yet. So you need to be able to create complementary RNA strands, understanding this difference. And then we're also going to have to do one more step over here. So I've obviously used little shapes to represent these amino acids. But we do know what each of these triplets are going to be coding for. This has been figured out. They have done this. So this is where the final step of protein synthesis comes in that you are going to need to have, to have the skill of, which is being able to read an mRNA codon table. So I know it looks really confusing. It looks kind of like big and, oh my gosh, where do I start? But I promise you it's really simple once you understand it. If you look at this first picture here, you can see a whole bunch of triplets in the middle. But you have first base of the mRNA codon on the left, second base of the mRNA codon on the top, and third base of the mRNA codon on the front. Again, I'm talking codons, a group of three. So let's practice this very quickly. Here's the original RNA strand that we used when we used our shapes. But let's now figure out which amino acid is, or which four amino acids in real life are actually going to be coded for here. So you start just with the first group of three nucleotides. This, the first codon. I'm referring to codon. So first letter, second letter, third letter. First base, second base, third base. What do I mean by base? I'm referring to nitrogenous base. Remember part of your nucleotide? The nitrogenous base, which is the only thing that's different. So you read it as per first, second, third. So I look at my first base. This is adenine. You look from here, it says first base of the mRNA codon, and you look between these rows here, and you find the one that matches. So if it's A, I'm looking here. So it's somewhere in this row to start with. Then I look at my second base, which is uracil. So now I look from the top in terms of the columns. So I need to match the first and the second. So if I'm somewhere in this row, and then in terms of the columns, I'm somewhere in this column, which means I can only be in this square. That's where the two of them match. But if we do look inside, I could have two potential possibilities. Doesn't always happen, but sometimes there is. If you still need to look at the difference between them, you look at the third base, which in this case is guanine. And if I'm still on this side, third base, I'm in this block. Guanine is down here at the bottom. So therefore, I'm going this way, this way and this way, which means AUG is going to be met. So yes, you can try and search for the actual triple codons that's in here, but as a rule of thumb, go first base, second base, third base, so you can get to that point there. You do not have to know what these abbreviations mean. You are not going to be asked, what does met mean? You do not have to know that that is methionine. But you can just, so you can just write down the little abbreviations that are here. Obviously, if you have a stop codon, you write it as stop. Or if there's something else, sometimes met is written as start, and you can write it as start from there. Okay, let's see. U, U, U. So if you were to, yeah, so U, U, U is the next one. How would you look for that? Well, you go first base, U, second base, U, third base, U, which gives me FE, P-H-E, U, U, U. What would U, C, G be? 
if you do the same things, it would be sir. And then what would CCA be as your last one? Pro. So again, C, C, A. And there's pro. Okay. And that's how you read a code on table. Nice and easy. There is a slightly different way of reading a code on table, as I could say, and that is using a code on circle. So this is mRNA thing, a codons, but it's just slightly different. The way that we read this is you start in the middle, then you go to the second circle, and then you go to the outside circle. So here's a new RNA strand. This is different to the previous one. So if this is your mRNA strand. This is your mRNA strand. Let's practice what is going to be the four different amino acids here. Okay, well, first one is G-U-C. G, I start in the middle. Then I move to the next circle, U. And then I've got a group of them here, C. So it's going to be Val. A-C-C. -C. A here. C. C, it's going to be thir. U, C, A. U, C, A. It's going to be sir. And G, G, G is going to be G, 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 which is gli. So it may make a difference in something, say, for example, if you had U, G, A, you need to make sure that you're following along specifically to that letter in the third side, whereas the other ones where it doesn't matter what the third base is, it's still going to code for the same amino acid. And that really is the end of protein synthesis. So a reminder, the skills that you are going to need to know, you're going to have to create complementary strands of RNA, and you're going to have to be able to read a codon table, either as the circle or as the table that's given here. You're also going to have to potentially identify phases from a picture, and I'll do that in the next video when we do some applied questions relating to protein synthesis. But please, I know that was a bit of a long video. Please make sure that you go back, re-watch, pause, make notes. This is the real, you know, nuts and bolts of the DNA that you do need to have an understanding of. So please make sure that you do go through this. Make sure that you get used to doing those complementary pairings, knowing which is codon, which is anti-codon, and identifying from the actual tables. Practice by yourself. Just create your own little RNA strand and see what the different amino acids would be. Next video, I'm going to go into some actual questions. You can see what these will kind of look like, and then we will move on to our next section after that. So thanks again for listening, and I hope that you're enjoying and hoping that this is helping you, and happy studying.